Next up, we have Ab Abishnek uh, Murth Murthy. Uh, he's going to be talking about backtesting time series forecasting algorithms. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me, uh, Abhishek. And today, yeah, I'll be talking about backtesting time series forecasting algorithms. <clears throat> uh, uh, so I'll also uh, discuss how we can implement some of these uh, concepts in uh, a couple of popular open source Python uh, time series libraries, SK Forecast and SK Time. Uh, this is joint work with Udisha, uh, my intern, uh, and a student at uh, Northeastern University. So if, I, if uh, she'll be on the job market soon, if anyone is looking, uh, please reach out. Uh, I work at Schneider Electric, which is a French company. It's a global energy management and industrial automation uh, leader. Uh, I'm based out of Boston. Primarily work uh, with IoT data, which is often in the form of time series. Uh, so uh, anomaly detection, time series forecasting, classification are super interesting uh, to me. Uh, I also teach at Northeastern University, where we cover these concepts as part of a graduate course. Uh, and uh, before all this, I got my PhD in computer science from Stony Brook University on Long Island. And these are some other places uh, that I have been uh, associated with. So really happy to be here, uh, and thanks again. Uh, the outline is as follows. So I'll uh, start by recapping what is time series forecasting uh, and motivate the need uh, for uh, backtesting. We'll get a brief overview of the process and then uh, get into the core iterative process that lies uh, at the heart of backtesting. Uh, we'll uh, take a deeper dive into a couple of uh, issues uh, that are relevant, specifically windowing functions uh, for time series and what do we do when, uh, what do we do between forecasts when new set of data becomes available. Um, after learning all these concepts, we'll try to apply them on an illustrative example uh, from energy management using SK time and SK forecast. And finally, uh, no pun intended, think about next steps uh, and uh, see how we can apply what we just learned uh, to take it to the next level uh, to things like hyperparameter tuning. Um, forecasting. Uh, it entails uh, predicting the future value of a time series signal. Uh, uh, from the data that we have observed thus far. And uh, so for example, we are at this point in time right now and uh, we have all the points in yellow available for us uh, to use. And uh, the goal is to predict the value of the signal in the next few time steps, say the next three time steps, which is called the forecast horizon. Uh, often this tends to be application dependent. Uh, but the goal could also be to understand what is the longest horizon that we can forecast up to. Um, let's say that is given to us for now. Uh, and we want to sort of, once we have done the prediction for the next three time steps, we can iterate. We can, maybe more data has come in and we want to continuously keep predicting the next few values uh, based on whatever observed data we have thus far. This is typically accomplished using machine learning based uh, forecasting models. Uh, and I'm just showing the typical inputs uh, to these models, right? It's very common to take the historical values of the signal itself, uh, because recent history is a good predictor of what's coming up next. Uh, so the uh, recent uh, values of the target variable are a very common input to these models. Uh, we may also want to rely on exogenous data, uh, so data that's coming from outside, like time of day, weather patterns to make uh, predictions for the target. Now, these exogenous variables can come from the past, right? Um, but they can also be forecasts in themselves. So we can use forecasted values of these exogenous variables to uh, predict our target variable. A common example is uh, the power product produced by windmills. Right? So if you have forecasts of the wind speed, it tends to be a very good uh, predictor of the power generated. So we can use the forecast of the wind speed to forecast the power generated. Uh, as I mentioned, we use machine learning based models to develop these forecasting models. And uh, here are a couple of examples, right? Uh, so let's say we have these 15 uh, data points given to us, this time series, and we want to build a uh, forecasting model for them. 
some really simple example by the way all this discussion will be model agnostic because we don't care what kind of model you are evaluating um, let's say we start with the simplest linear regression where the next time step is modeled as a linear combination of the previous time steps so here we have um, x hat of t plus one which is the next value uh, being modeled as a function of the past three observed inputs uh, xt xt minus one and xt minus two um, we can also have random forest, slightly more complicated uh, kind of models that ensemble uh, regression trees to make the final prediction. Uh, let's say the data scientist has uh, wants to develop this model uh, uh, for rolling out in production. Uh, before they do that, they need to establish the efficacy of their model. Uh, and uh, one of the most important KPIs for any machine learning model is to demonstrate how well it generalizes to unseen data. Uh, so they are interested in showing that, sure, my, data, uh, my model has learned this training set well, but it can actually forecast on data that it hasn't seen thus far. This is the uh, central uh, concern when it comes to evaluating uh, machine learning models. So when we look at tabular world, uh, we accomplish uh, this using cross-validation, right? Where essentially we start off uh, with the data that we have available for training and we split it up into different folds. In the first round, we may want to reserve the first fold for uh, testing and train on the rest of the uh, data that we have. And then we can evaluate the model on the test fold to get an initial estimate of the performance. Uh, let's call it E1. And we repeat that uh, on all the folds so that every data point at least participates in testing once um, to get multiple performance estimates. Uh, what this does in the tabular world is, is it ensures that all the data that is available has been used for training and testing. Uh, and also we get more robust estimates of the model performance itself um, uh, because we do this multiple times. Also it enables uh, hyperparameter tuning that we are going to talk about later in the, uh, in the talk. Now all this is not possible to do in uh, uh, with time series, right? We cannot create multiple folds uh, on temporal data because there is an inherent sequential nature to the data. And uh, 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 moreover, there are some uh, aspects to time series forecasting, especially in production, that are unique in the sense uh, we may want to do forecasts after every few time steps. And so when a, that time elapses, the model has access to new data. And so we may want to ask, what would the model do in production with that new data as it becomes available? Uh, we may want to train uh, the model again, or maybe ignore it. Um, so it's these settings that the data scientist needs to consider, these uh, application requirements that the product manager has to specify uh, so that we can account for them in the evaluation process. And that's where backtesting comes in, right? So backtesting is the process of using the historical data that is available to us um, to train the fo forecasting model and evaluate it in uh, settings that are similar to what it would encounter in the production system. Okay? Let me illustrate this again with an example that we have. So the, in this running example, we, we have these 15 data points. Uh, the first step in backtesting is to sort of create an initial training window, which is established by these first nine points that is given to us. Uh, and that automatically establish the first, establishes the first test window uh, as the next three time steps. Um, and we can go ahead and train our model on it. Uh, once we have the model, we can generate these predictions, uh, which are shown in blue here. Note that we actually have uh, the observed history for time points 10 through 12. Uh, and then we can compute how far off our predictions, uh, how far are our predictions from the uh, ground truth. For this, we can use any of the multiple performance metrics uh, out there. There's a very rich literature uh, on uh, performance metrics for forecasting that I'm not gonna delve here. Uh, I'm just listing a couple of uh, most popular ones, MAPE and MSE. So we can, once we have the first set of predictions, we can compute our performance metric uh, and see how far off we are. Uh, and then ask what would the model have done in production, right? When is the next forecast expected from the model? Fine, we, we made a forecast at t equals to nine. Um, when is the next forecast expected? Let's say for simplicity, the next forecast is actually expected at time 12. Uh, that is after the horizon has 
elapsed. Uh, and so then the question is, by this time in production, the model would have seen three new data points, 10 through 12. What do we do with it? What does the model do with it? Does it ignore it or does it use it somehow to make the next set of predictions uh, from t equals to 13 through 15? Um, and that's the kind of evaluation that we want to do um, uh, before we can make the next set of predictions, compute the forecast and iterate, uh, compute the metrics and iterate. So this is sort of an overview of what backtesting looks like. It essentially uh, entails making predictions, computing the metrics, but then asking what would the model do after for the next forecast. So in the next few slides, what we're going to do is take a slightly deeper look uh, uh, as to how this works uh, and uh, how we sort of generate uh, these performance, multiple estimates of the performance uh, across the data that we have to create a benchmark for the model. Um, so here's the canonical iterative process that lies at the heart of backtesting. Right? Again, let's take the same example. And here, instead of training on the first six data points, uh, let's say we are training on the fir uh, first nine data points. Here, I'm going to start with training on the first six data points, just to give us a few more test folds so that we can illustrate this process. Um, and uh, we want to create, uh, we, we want to test, we want to create a model with the 15 data points, and we say that the first initial training set cons consists of the first six points. Uh, the first step in backtesting, of course, is to create the initial version of the model using this data, M. Let's call it M. Uh, and we can use it to make the predictions. Um, and uh, we have the forecast for time steps 7 through 9. Uh, and remember, we also have the ground truth. For we so we can compute the performance metric. Again, this could be any performance metric. And uh, also, reminder that all this is model agnostic. Um, so once we have computed the initial performance metric on this window E0, um, we again ask, what is the application's requirement off of the model? Right? Uh, when is the next forecast expected? Say, again, for simplicity's sake, the next forecast is actually expected at t equals to 9. Uh, that is when the horizon has elapsed. Uh, and so we have to ask, how do we handle this new data that has come in? Right? Do we expand the view of the training, potential training set that the model has, or do we just simply ignore it? Um, so how do we sort of, uh, sort of move this window of training data that is available? And also, as more data comes in, what do we do with it, actually? Right? Um, say we want to remember this. Once we want to remember the new data points, what do we actually, how do we process them? Uh, there are typically three options here. Uh, one is we do nothing, in the sense we retain the model that was trained using the first six data steps, uh, data points, and uh, not even use the new data that has come in to make the subsequent forecast. So we continue as is, but do nothing. Um, the second option is actually to use the model that was trained with the first six data points, but use, uh, but sort of leverage this new data that has come in as inputs to the model when we produce the subsequent forecast. This is called the model update uh, strategy. And thirdly, uh, as and when new data comes in, we can create new versions of the model by retraining. Um, so every time new data comes in, uh, we retrain the model, uh, and uh, uh, we are ready for the next set of forecasts. In any case, once this is resolved at t equals to 9, we have to produce the next set of forecasts for the next test fold. Um, and we can do this as such. And we are back to making the predictions and computing the performance metric. Right? Uh, so we can, based on the ground truth that is available, we can compute how well we did on this window. And then again, the question uh, uh, recurs as to what do we do with, what would the model have done uh, in production uh, with this new data as it, as it saw? Right? So uh, backtesting is this process of sort of create, uh, making these forecasts, asking uh, what the application requirement is, and uh, 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 testing the model in that process. Uh, so this is the sort of iterative process. We we identified two win two po possible issues that that are interesting. One is how do we exactly create these windows and move them, and what exactly are these steps? Right? What what are these possible options uh, that we talked about? So we're going to sort of look at it a bit uh, more deeply in the next few slides. 
yeah, so of course there's more forecast to be done, more uh, performance estimates to be made. Um, so uh, at a high level, I mean, there are several options possible for defining these uh, windowing functions for our data, but the most basic options uh, entail either sort of expanding the window as more data comes in. So in this option, we remember all the data that we started off with, and we keep adding the new data as it comes in. So this is all the data that the model has available in the next uh, round. Um, possibly the application allows us to do that. But there may also be a case where there are constraints on how much data you can remember, in which case you may want to slide the entire window to the right, thereby remembering the most recent uh, uh, data that you have and only use this most recent data to make the subsequent rounds of uh, forecasts. And there is everything in between. Right? I'm just showing you the two most basic options here. Um, moreover, it's important to note that the uh, the prediction may be requested sooner than the forecast horizon itself, right? Uh, so for example, if uh, we are trying to do forecasting for uh, such that the forecasts are fed into a model predictive controller that is uh, essentially optimizing the actions of an agent, um, we may want to actually make these forecasts much more frequently. So even though the forecast horizon is of three steps, we want to generate a forecast at every time step. Uh, and so in this case, the window will not move by three steps at a time. It may, it may move slower, uh, but uh, you can, of course, uh, either expand it or slide it, as we talked before. Right? So this is, uh, uh, this, uh, these are sort of some very simple ways of configuring these windowing functions. But as I mentioned, there is everything in between. There's a lot of mixing and matching that we can do. This brings us to the next issue of, OK, fine. So we, we have defined the windows. Uh, and we are sort of moving this uh, uh, window and making more data available to the model. But what does the model do with that data, right? Uh, and this brings us to the issue of uh, model refitting versus updates. Um, so again, let's go back in time and uh, look at uh, t equals to 6, where we started off with. So this is the initial training data that is available. Uh, and we said the, the first step is to create the actual model, uh, M. Uh, and let's say, for argument's sake, that uh, this is going to be an auto-regressive model in the sense it actually depends on uh, the past three inputs uh, here. Uh, so xt plus 1 is modeled as a function of xt, t minus 1, and t minus 2. And so if we have six data points available, uh, this is how the training data set would look like uh, initially. right? So essentially x1, and x1, x2, x3 are mapped to x4 x2, x3, x4 are mapped to x5, so on and so forth, right? So the job of training the model is essentially uh, uh, the job of learning this mapping fun function from these three inputs to this output. Once we have done that, we are ready to make the first forecast uh, at x7. Let's call it x7 hat, right, because it's a prediction. Uh, and that is made using the ground, the observed history that is available for us. So the past three inputs, x4, x5, x6, are used to make uh, uh, the prediction at time point seven. If we are talking of recursive multi-step forecasting, to make the next two forecasts, we are going to use the prediction that was made for time point seven. So to make, to get x8 hat, we would use x7 hat, the previous prediction, and x5 and x6, but because those are observed history, we can use them uh, for our forecast. And similarly for x9, uh, we would use the predictions that were made at time point 7 and 8 as inputs to the model. Uh, we can do this recursive multi-step forecasting to get forecast for the next three time steps. Uh, and um, as we looked at the iterative process before, um, compute the performance metric for this window uh, and uh, that, that sort of finishes up the, the prediction part. And now again, we ask what would the model do with this new data that comes in. Right? And as we mentioned, there are three options. Uh, first one, uh, 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 the, the goal is of course to produce this next set of, uh, to do something with the model so, so that we can produce the next three uh, forecasts. Um, the first step is to not do anything, uh, to retain the model that we started off with. And uh, to get the forecast at time point 10, we need the past three values, and we are going to use the forecast that we made. Right? 
Uh, this will, of course, potentially accumulate error uh, because we are using forecasts to make more forecasts. Um, but that's an option. Maybe your application does not have access uh, to the most recent data because of network delays and things like that, in which case uh, you would have to use the do-nothing option while evaluating the model. Uh, maybe the model has access to it, but we don't have the computational power to retrain uh, 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 the model. In which case, we're going to use the observed history uh, that we got, but retain the same model to make the next set of forecasts. And finally, uh, we can take all the data that has just come in and add it to our uh, training data set and uh, 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 retrain the entire model from scratch. So now we have expanded this data. So we have new mappings to learn uh, and then use the most recent history to make the forecast for X uh, at time point 10. Right? So hope this clarifies what we mean by model update and model refit and of course do nothing. And depending on the application constraint, one would have to uh, sort of program them uh, and evaluate the model accordingly. Uh, and we sort of make these choices uh, in each window. We don't have to do either update or refit in every time step. We may want to keep updating the model till sufficient data becomes available and then refit. Again, this is an option that the product manager can pass on and we can test that strategy also. So I hope this clarifies what, uh, how backtesting works and uh, what are the issues in it. Let's see how we can apply it in, uh, a, uh, in, in a very simple public data set. Uh, this is power consumption. Uh, this is hourly power consumption in a particular market in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, we're just looking at 125 days worth of data. Uh, and this is power consumption uh, in this particular market. Uh, and uh, let's say we reserve 80% of the data for uh, training and backtesting. And uh, this is the kind of model that we want to learn. Uh, we want to learn a random forest uh, that has about 250 trees, and uh, each tree is about 10 deep. Uh, um, and the constraint that we impose is we're going to use the past six time steps to forecast the next 24 hours worth of data. Right? Um, so forecast next 24 hours using the past six values. Let's see how we can do this in escape time, right? Uh, so this is how we sort of uh, declare our sort of uh, uh, the, the model itself. Here I say that I want a random forest uh, based model and make reduction is this SK times function to sort of create this tabular form of training data. So the forecasting problem is converted to the tabular format using make reduction and we specify that we want to use the past uh, six values. Um, once we have done that, we can choose what kind of window we want. Uh, we have a, a bunch of windows that we can configure in SK time. Uh, expanding windows uh, need uh, the step length by how much they are expanded every time. And we can also specify an initial training window which need not be the same as uh, step length. Right? So we start off with about 10 days of data and expand it by 24 hours after every forecast. Uh, sliding window also works similarly. And once we have configured this, we can use uh, the backtesting function in SKA time evaluate, uh, where we pass all this, and it does the entire job of iteration uh, for us. Uh, so we, we need to specify what strategy we want to use between each of these windows. This can be refit or update or do nothing, as we just discussed. Uh, and it will do the entire uh, iterative process and come back to us with results. So let's look at how those look, at, look like. Uh, uh, SK time actually returns a lot of information uh, after the back testing has concluded. Um, there is the actual folds that it created on the data. So the, for every fold, it provides what was the training data, what was the testing data, and what was the prediction made by the model. Uh, but we also get for each fold, uh, so essentially once we have this, we can make these plots, inspect what's going on. But we, for every fold, we also get a performance metric. We can customize what performance metric we want. Um, it also provides us how much time it took to fit the model for that fold, uh, what was the time taken to make the prediction, just to get some benchmarking estimates uh, for you uh, to go back to your product manager saying that if I want to use this strategy, this is how much time it's taking in between forecasts uh, and things like that. And then there's some other bunch of metadata that's returned. 
So this was SK time. Let me quickly cover what SK forecast does. Uh, SK forecast again allows you to specify the uh, model itself. Uh, when we say six lags, it uses the past six values. And it has this function called backtesting forecaster, uh, where we can configure the backtesting experiment. Uh, it has a couple of uh, arguments. So when fixed, tra uh, train si fixed train size can be essentially used to create either expanding windows or sliding windows. Uh, and uh, when refit is uh, false, it defaults to the update option that we just discussed. And if it is true, it refits every time the window uh, moves. Um, the output, of course, is the actual predictions itself, the forecasted values, and the metric, which is an average of all the metrics uh, in the folds that were used. And when we set the verbosity to high, we can actually see uh, the window expanding in every fold. More data gets added uh, to the training set because the refit was set to true. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it sort of returns the predictions. And uh, for the sliding window, we can see the size of the window remains the same. And uh, uh, it, it churns through the data and gives us back all the predictions and the performance metric. Just to conclude, I'll uh, leave you with this one slide. Um, Backtesting essentially is a multi-dimensional, uh, is essentially designing experiments in a multi-dimensional space. Uh, on one uh, sort of dimension, you have the actual folds themselves and to do the work of uh, computing the performance metric for each folds. Uh, but you can also uh, design these experiments to play with different models. Uh, we can also sort of, uh, of course, importantly, uh, play with the different settings that are imposed by the application. Uh, and so clearly this multidimensional space grows very quickly. So companies invest quite a bit to create platforms where experiments can scale uh, this multidimensional space. And as a teaser, uh, all this also enables the fourth dimension of hyperparameter tuning that we didn't cover. Uh, but uh, essentially this is grid search with cross validation for people that know uh, scikit-learn. So once we have this nailed down, we can extend this to actually find out why 250 estimators works for me for my random forest uh, versus, say, 20. Right? So that's the kind of hyperparameter tuning that's enabled by this process. So systematically evaluate the model and at the same time uh, tune the hyperparameters. And with that, I open up for questions. We have time for one question. Um, there was a slice I saw that you make uh, the prediction for nine hats based on the prediction for six, seven, eight hats. Uh, my question is, uh, why do we use the previous predictions uh, instead of the actual data? So I think you're talking about... Uh, uh, you just, yeah, I just saw that on... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that one. This one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the, the point that I wanted to get across is this is a possibility. This is an option available during the backtesting process. When would one find themselves in this uh, strategy, maybe there is some delay because of which the model does not have access to the most recent data. The data is there, but the model doesn't have access to it. So if you find yourself in such a situation, you need to use this option when evaluating the model. Right? So assuming that the model data will be available uh, uh, will send you off, off track. Right? So this is an option to consider and ask yourself, is this your situation? If not, great. You, let's use the most recent data and update the history that is available. Right? So there are just different options when designing the experiment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I have a question. Does this model have a way to uh, give an uncertainty estimation for the predictions? Sorry, I... I uncertainty estimation, does it have... in provide something for that? Uh, yeah, so conformal predictions uh, um, 
are uh, a hot topic in forecasting. So uh, that is another dimension to all this, right? So we can, uh, when configuring these uh, experiments, we can ask how can we play with the forecasting settings uh, so that some uncertainty requirements are met, right? So that, that could be uh, the product manager's request, saying that uh, I, I don't want point forecast, I want distributions. Uh, tell me what settings uh, should, what, because those settings essentially translate to the requirements on the use case, right? So uh, they can come back to you and yes, so we can, we can do that, uh, we can explore that dimension also when setting up our experiments, absolutely. It's an important uh, line of work right now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.